Many years ago, it was probably sometime in the 1990s, I was still a young man then, and I was heading to a Mount Angel Oktoberfest, which is happening this very weekend. I was heading to Mount Angel Oktoberfest with a group of friends, and uh, we got there and had corn on the cob and probably funnel cakes and deep fried Oreos and whatever else you eat at Oktoberfest. And it was a beautiful autumn afternoon. And, um, and we went to enter the beer garden. And as we got to the entrance to the beer garden, I realized I didn't have my wallet on me. I didn't have ID. I couldn't go in. I had been to the gym that morning. Back in those days, I went to the gym. And I'd left my wallet in my gym bag. So there I was at Oktoberfest. And my friends went into the beer garden. And I had one friend that stayed out with me. And we walked around, and he said, hey, have you ever been up to the Abbey? And I said, no. Well, maybe when I was very, very little. And so we walked up to the Abbey. And it was a beautiful day, and it was just a wonderful time. It was very peaceful. I think we saw ripe pears on the trees near the cemetery and walked around past the Stations of the Cross and went into the Abbey Church and the monks were singing Vespers. And so I had no idea what Vespers was. I mean, I had grown up Catholic, but I had never heard of Vespers. I had no idea what that even was, but it was, it was beautiful. And the monks sang Vespers and we walked around a little bit more and I was so thankful as we walked back down the hill to meet our friends, so thankful that I did not have my ID on me, and so thankful that we had come up to the Abbey. And so we rejoined our friends, and my life went on. Well, a few years later, a few years later, um, I had begun to think that maybe God was calling me to the priesthood and I kept hearing at Mass, I was going to Holy Rosary at the time, and I kept hearing after Mass this announcement for this discernment retreat for young men interested in the priesthood. And I heard it and kind of forgot about it and then I heard it again the next week. I started to think about it. I worked downtown at the time and I would walk up to St. Michael's for the noon Mass and one day as I was walking up to Mass I would pray the rosary on my way, and I said to the Blessed Mother that if her son wanted me to be a priest, that she would make it happen. Well, a couple days later, that same friend said to me, hey, let's, let's, uh, let's, let's go do something. Let's, let's drive up to Mount Angel Abbey. And I thought, oh, that sounds good. And I remembered that day at Oktoberfest a few years before. And I thought, yeah, let's go up to Mount Angel. So we drove up to Mount Angel and uh, walked around, went into the church, and I saw this poster inside the church for this discernment retreat for young men interested in the priesthood. And I thought, hmm. Well, we went in and prayed. And as we came back outside, we saw this monk far across the campus with his hood up. And I said to my friend, I think it'd be really neat to talk to a monk. And he said, well, why don't you go to that retreat next weekend? And I said, that retreat? That retreat's for young men interested in the priesthood. And he said, yes, I know, I'd be good for you. And so it seemed like the sign I had asked for, and I ended up going to the retreat. And a few years later, I entered the seminary. Well, in that, of course, we were talking about God's providence last week and how sometimes our own plans don't go the way we wish them to, but things actually better happen. Well, we can also see in that, well, and as we get, got back, we found out the bad things had been happening in that beer garden. I was thankful I hadn't been there. God saved me from that. But thinking back upon that, you know, I can see that in my own conversion, that in my worldly life at the time uh, and before that, you know, I was like a soul that was dead, that was brought back to life and shown 
this beautiful life that I didn't anticipate. And ever since then, I felt that my duty to praise God, to speak with the divine praises, and uh, to give my life over to God. We can see something similar in this example in the Gospel today of the young man. And St. Bonaventure points out that indeed the order of justice demands that sin be recompensed by death. For the wages of sin are death, according to the Apostle. But in this Gospel, the awakening of the dead is noted with the confirming speech when it adds that he sat up and began to speak. We find, moreover, that the Lord raised three dead persons, namely the young girl and Lazarus and this young man. And the awakening of each one is distinguished by a proof for each, for the first raising of the young girl is proved by eating, as elsewhere in the Gospel, and the second by the raising of Lazarus by walking, and the third, the raising of the young man, is proved by speaking. So eating, walking, and speaking. Eating regards a vegetative act, walking an act of the senses, and speaking an act of reason. And we can see here the three types of souls. We have the vegetative soul of a plant, a sensitive soul of an animal, and the rational soul of a human being. Now, of course, uh, a human being also has a vegetative soul. We also grow and we die, our bodies. And we also have a sensitive soul because we have the use of our eyes and our ears and our nose and our, our, uh, our lips and our, our hands to touch. And we also have a rational soul because we have an intellectual mind capable of reasoning and wisdom. So these three raising, uh, these three persons the Lord has raised from the dead are a sign, really, showing that, that God is the Lord of, of all life and uh, of, of all there is and of all the parts of man, not just compartmentalized. It's not just our intellect that is saved and it's not just our senses that are purified and it's not just our body that is redeemed and, and, uh, and destined for resurrection and eternal life, but it's all of them. All of those make up what we are as a human being. Well, we continue with St. Bonaventure. So that a threefold proof be known the giver of life and the, give, and the Lord of the soul's salvation. So, the giver of life and the soul's salvation according to his power and virtue. First, an awakening is proved with eating, which regards the vegetative act. Second, the awakening of Lazarus is proved with walking, with re which regards an act of the senses. And third, the awakening of the adolescent is proved by speaking, which regards an act of reason. Now, there is no doubt that this awakened young man was speaking words of divine praise is not proper to the dead, but to the living. Now, we can say that even just in terms of those who are spiritually dead. Now, think about that. Those who are spiritually dead, are they praising, are they speaking words of divine praise? Well, if they do, that is what, one of the means by which they will be brought back to the land of the living. It begins with the speaking of divine praise, which is a response to God's grace, and then all the things that follow. But now think about this, that we are living, we are living among the walking dead. We are living among the walking dead. We live in a post-Christian society where many people are not baptized, which means that they are the walking dead. They have no life in them. They have natural life. When that natural life comes to an end, what is there? But they don't have, they don't have uh, supernatural life. They don't have sanctifying grace in their souls. They don't have God dwelling in their souls. 
And so we live among the walking dead, which are also those who maybe once were baptized, but have renounced their faith, who have no fear of God, who don't think of living godly lives, who blaspheme the name of Jesus and Mary and the saints, and who don't think anything of pleasing God, maybe don't think of God. My own life was that way at one point when I was away from the church. And so... What is it that brings a person back to life? Well, and what is it that sustains life? This young man has been brought back to life, and he speaks the words of divine praise. And we could say, like the praying of Vespers, or the praying of Lods, which is a song of praise, praising the Lord, giving thanks to the Lord, which is our duty. Well, let's continue with St. Bonaventure. Let's see, where are we here? There is no doubt that this awakened young man was speaking words of divine praise, which is not proper to the dead, but to the living. In this it is apparent that he was clearly alive because life is discerned through movement and the senses. But because he had awakened this one for the consolation of the mother, he therefore gave him to his mother. And in this, we also see uh, a sign of the Church. The Church is our Holy Mother. We are born from her womb in the baptismal font. And this is why we call priests Father, because it is the priest who baptizes us and the Mother Church in whom we are reborn, in whose womb we are reborn, or from whose womb we are reborn into eternal life. Now it is not without mystery that the girl in her awakening is said to have rose up, that this adolescent sat up, and Lazarus came forth, bound feet and hands with bandages. For the sin of knowledge is understood through the death of the girl in the home. The sin of works is understood through the adolescent at the gate, and the sin of habit through Lazarus in the sepulcher. And as grave sins lead leave greater consequences. Therefore, the person who only sinned in thought arose immediately once enlivened and with few remaining difficulties. The person who sinned, however, in deeds sits when enlivened because the inclination still remains. And the person who, habi who habitually sinned is bound when enlivened because that one has a great inclination to evil and difficulty in regard to the good. In other words, we know, we all know from experience, that if we merely have a sinful thought, we forget about it. And so we repent and uh, we confess that, we move on, and, and we don't necessarily return to that. But if we've committed a sinful deed, well, that deed has a certain memory that we hold on to. So even while we may confess it and be forgiven of it, we're still, we still have the memory of that deed we once did, and we are likely to ponder over that, and even possibly to commit that deed again due to our memory. But that's very different still from a, a deed that is done habitually, all the time. That deed has become second nature, and we do it even without thinking. And for that, we may confess and have it forgiven, but it is with great difficulty that we put that deed behind us and that we are free from it. Now, it's possible by means of penance, which is the medicine, our prayers, our penances, pilgrimages, novenas, adoration, reading and pondering over the Holy Scriptures, praying the rosary, all of that, fasting, self-denial, all of that is the medicine that heals the memories of these sins and breaks our habit and helps us to form new virtues of, of holy habits, of good works. Now each of us, we know, all of us have been delivered from many, many sins. 
We've been delivered from so much. God has given us so many chances to make good on his forgiveness of our sins. So many chances. And we see in the crowd of the gospel that fear seized upon them and they began to magnify God. And indeed, according to St. Bonaventure, God must be magnified with reverence for the work of recreation. Because first, there is a declaration of power in the defeat of the ancient enemy, and second, the manifestation of wisdom in relieving the prostrate person, and third, the expression of mercy in the mission of the Holy Spirit. Now, we can see here that in God's recreation, as he, recre as he um, recreates us anew through baptism, saving us from eternal death, and as he restores us to life by means of penance, sacramental confession, that our thoughts, our deeds, and our habits, God is the master of all life, and therefore he gives us grace to help us with all of those things. He gives us grace by means of his mercy, of his wisdom, and sending the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, to transform our, our souls, to give us true strength and perseverance and wisdom to live new lives. So we need to imitate that boy who speaks words of divine praise, and we need to imitate the crowd who magnify the works of God. And all the more reason when we think back on our lives, and I can think back on my own life and that day at Mount Angel and discovering, uh, discovering a, a new path that God wished to, to show me. And this is why we have Vespers six nights a week here. Because I grew up Catholic and I never knew there was such a thing. But do you know that Vespers was, was to be prayed in every parish church, every Sunday in the United States from the year 1791, the first synod of Baltimore. Every parish, every Sunday, sung Vespers. And that continued. In the 20th century, it kind of waned. People got busy with their cars and their TVs and moving out to the suburbs, and all of that. The Second Vatican Council called for priests to see to it that Vespers is prayed in the church on Sundays and feast days. And that has not happened. And it needs to. But not just that the priests need to do it, but the people need to be praying it as well. And this is what it means to praise and magnify God, not just by our works, but by our voices. Now, that doesn't mean you have to attend Vespers in the church. That wouldn't hurt you. It'd be good. You'd like it. It may be that you have to drive too far to do so. But you should be praying it in your homes. And whether it's Vespers or whether a family rosary, which really is a replacement for Vespers, for the laity, you need to be having a daily prayer. You need to be giving to God outside of Mass, something so that when you come to Mass, what's put in that offertory basket is not just your money, but rather yourself. All your prayers, your works, your joys, and your sufferings of this day and every day united with the holy sacrifice of the Mass. For all the intentions. Now our Lord gives us new life, not just, in our, not just by the resurrection of the body, he brings souls back to life. He gives us wisdom by means of sanctifying grace to elevate our intellects, to enlighten us. So we have to give all that back to him. We have to give him back our memories, our will, our intelligence, our deeds, our whole self, our bodies, our minds, our wills, and our future. And today, and it's never too late to start. It's never too late to start anew. Because our Lord had a life that he wished to show me, and I'm grateful for it. And he has a life to show you, 
Every new day brings new opportunities, new promises, new hope. And so that is what I wish for all of you, that you would share my joy and that I would share in yours as well. Amen.